Well, greetings. Good morning, church. It's a joy to be with you at Christ Church Middletown, <clears throat> and especially as Father Bill prepares to retire. We've got time, 10 months, but, but it's now a part of the current ethos. And so um, uh, I'm here, and we prayerfully begin the work of succession and discerning the kind of priest who will join you in carrying out Christ's mission in this part of his dominion. I am deeply grateful to Father Bill for his work among you these past three years, and above all, for the love and care he has shown you. Haven't you been blessed? Yeah, yeah we can do that. Can do that. <laughs> By the grace and power of the Holy Spirit, he came into a church that was wounded and ministered to a people that were hurting. His, he threw his arms around you and held you and loved you, helping you to reclaim yourselves and your life in Christ anew. And this is the work I asked and charged him to do. He has done this and more. And Christ Church is thriving, aren't you? Things are happening. New carpet, painting, just <laughs> new spirit in the place, right? That the, the furnishings and the beauty are all symbolic of what's going on in the wider community. And that's good. Thank you, Father Bill. And uh, thank you to Edna Marie for uh, your situation. There, oh, sorry, there you're right in front of me. Um, for your support of Bill and for your part in this ministry, too. So we'd like to come up with you. I know you're both looking forward to your return to New Bern and to being closer to family that need you. And again, there's still 10 months before we all say goodbye, but I did want to offer you my thanks and best wishes. I also want to express my gratitude for the leadership of Cynthia McCormick and Barbara Garrity, your warden, Cynthia. Uh, thank you both. Can we acknowledge them? And, and also, uh, the other members of the vestry, uh, vestry members stand up. Let's uh, acknowledge the vestry of this church. Uh, they do day in and day out, they do the work. I thank you for your outstanding commitment and leadership during these three years of healing and renewal. You have been hardworking, steady, grace-filled, and faithful. So we have the perfect gospel reading for today. We're in Mark's gospel, chapter one. Jesus calls Simon, Andrew, James, and John a uh, fisherman. Um, uh, I'll take a quick discursus. I, when I was the rector at St. Paul's Church in Delray Beach, Florida, uh, one of my parishioners who I was close to, he was junior warden for many years, uh, John Kilpatrick, uh, loved to go fishing. He went fishing all the time. Uh, the problem was he never caught any fish. <laughs> I asked him about this. He said to me, I'm a fish conservationist. <laughs> We're in Mark's Gospel, chapter one. I love Mark's Gospel, it is fast, it is urgent. It minces no words. From his opening, Mark tells us what he's about. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and it is good news. It's good news we all need. It's the good news of Jesus and his kingdom. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The time is fulfilled. The people have been waiting, waiting for the revealing of God's anointed one, God's Messiah, God's Christ. Well, here he is. He comes on the heels of John the Baptist, that shrill voice who cried out in the wilderness, prepare the way, prepare the way, prepare the way for the Messiah and his reign. Repent. Turn from the lures and allures of this world, the illusions and delusions of the Roman Empire and its militaristic oppression. Turn from emperor worship and the gaudiness of Herod, Rome's puppet king. Turn from its materialism and selfishness. Turn from its idolatry, the Philadelphia Eagles, the Minnesota Vikings, Elizabeth Warren, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, and return to God. Return to God, the source of all life and love. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to one another. The kingdom is near you, Jesus says. It is as close as I am to you. Turn, he says, turn to me and believe. Turn to me and live. That's the opening message of today's gospel. And in the very next frame, we see it happen. 
people turned to him. And Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the, into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. When that translation first came out, it really bugged me. You know, it used to be what? You remember what it was? Fishers of men. So they wanted to be more inclusive. And, I, and, and the first time I, we heard it, it was at, when I was at General Theological Seminary in Chapel. It was the first time I heard that read out loud. And I will make you fish for people made me bust out laughing. <laughs> but we know what it means. And it's serious. And then it happens again as he went a little farther. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John who were in their boat mending their nets. I had the privilege of going to the Holy Land. I've been there a couple of times. And I literally have gone down to the Sea of Galilee. And as I walked on down there, I saw this red awning with yellow letters in Hebrew on it. I sounded out. I, went, I, I don't do Hebrew very well. I do bet Greek better. But I, I saw this red awning. Yellow, it went, McDonald's. But I kept walking. And I saw the Sea of Galilee and literally saw a fisher mending their nets. It's there. It's still there. It happens. And he went a little farther. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets, and immediately, immediately called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. There are a couple of things to note about this. Jesus meets those men where they are in their workaday worlds. They didn't have any special preparation. They didn't do anything particular to get ready for this moment. He meets them where they are, and they respond. They respond immediately. Mark's gospel loves the word immediately. Things are happening, and they're happening fast. Their response is so immediate, it takes us by surprise. No inquiry, no due diligence, no. Jesus calls, and they follow. In his commentary on this passage in Mark's Gospel, biblical scholar Lamar Williamson observes, we are not told whether these fishermen had previously enjoyed their work or detested it, whether they were prosperous or impoverished. We do not know how the two pairs of brothers got along with each other, nor how the sons of Zebedee related to their father. The sun may have been bright and the breeze off the fresh lake, but Mark does not say so. The absence of details that interests us pushes us, he writes, to remember the primary interest of the gospel, the authority of Jesus and the response of his disciples. Here, Williamson writes, the two basic foci of the entire gospel stand forth clearly, the presence and word of Jesus on the one hand and the response to his call to discipleship on the other. Two foci, the presence and word of Jesus on the one hand and response to his call to discipleship on the other. This is important. The one focus is God's initiative. God acts. God sent Jesus. God sent Jesus as his word. Is in Jesus is the summing up of all that God is of all that God wants. St. Paul puts it well in his letter to the Colossians. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. For in him, Paul writes, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Wow. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The first focus of the gospel and our Christian faith is Jesus Christ, the image of God, the icon of God, the fullness of God, the one in whom the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. Sometimes we forget this or don't give it enough priority. You know it's so. We get caught up in other things, even in church. We get caught up in the building or the social side of things or in conflict or even in busyness that sometimes loses sight of Jesus the ground and source that's supposed to be behind our busyness of why we do what we do. Busy with family promise? It's a great thing. It takes time. It takes commitment. But it is our joy. Thanks be to God for those of you who support that important ministry. Why do we do it? 
because we do it for and in the name of Jesus and his love. To serve Jesus, to understand Jesus as the very image and icon of God, we have to know him. We need to know him inside out, and he needs to know us inside out. We can only do that by studying, reading, marking inwardly, digesting the Gospels, absorbing them prayerfully so that they become part of our warp and our woof. We do it through regular worship, Eucharistic worship. That is worship in which Christ is made real and present for us in the bread and in the wine, and we take him in so that he becomes part of us. Yes, the first focus of the gospel in our life is Jesus Christ crucified. Christ crucified and raised and his word and very self made present to us and in us. And he comes with authority, with the authority of a command, love. A new command I give to you, he says, that you love one another as I have loved you. It is the command of his summary of the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that leads us to the second foci of the gospel to which Lamar Williamson referred us, and our response to Jesus' call, our discipleship, how we are as followers of Jesus. How do we live in Christ? How do we love in Christ? The answer is by knowing him, loving him, attaching ourselves to him and to his ways. We do this through prayer, listening to him as he speaks through the Gospels and speaks by the power of the Holy Spirit through our lives. We listen and obey. I'm aware that some in this church have studied the rule of St. Benedict. It's a spiritual classic. Our Book of Common Prayer and our life as Episcopalians is strongly influenced by this rule, by its emphasis on an ordered and balanced life of prayer, study, and service. The rule opens with the word, listen. Listen, my son, Benedict writes to his followers. And Benedict understands fully the relationship of this word in Latin with its root in the word obey. To listen is to listen for obedience. Uh, some materials that uh, Father Bill will be using as he works with you in the succession will have that concept in it strongly. In her commentary on the rule of St. Benedict, Joan Chittister, an amazingly insightful and spiritual woman, writes about this. Uh, a part of spirituality, she says, learning to hear what God wants in any given situation and being quick to respond to that, to welcome it and faithfully put it in practice. Obedience, she writes, the willingness to listen to the voice of God in life. Listen to that. Obedience, the willingness to listen to the voice of God in life is what will wrench us out of the limitations of our own landscape. We are being called, she writes, to something outside of ourselves, something greater than ourselves, something beyond ourselves. It's true, isn't it? It's true. It's why we come to church. It's why we are the church, the body of Christ, isn't it? To be part of something meaningful, purposeful, something quite literally divine. For us as Episcopalians, the principal framework for our life in Christ is provided in the baptismal covenant with its five lifestyle clauses which commit us to continuing in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, to persevering in resisting evil and whenever we fall into sin, to repenting and returning to the Lord to proclaim by words and example, to by word and example, the good news of God in Christ. That is to do it in our own lives, to do in our own lives what Jesus did in his by calling Andrew, Simon, James, and John, and to be what he called them to be, fishers of people, not like my friend John Kilpatrick, fish conservationists. We Episcopalians have been fish conservationists for far too long. We need to share the story, share what God's doing in our lives, People need us to do this today. People are hurting, alienated. We're so angry as a society, so polarized. Our baptismal promises call us to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourselves and to strive for justice and peace among all people and to respect the dignity of every human being. 
These are the terms of our discipleship. These are what our Christian lives are to look like each and every day. It also needs to be observed, God calls a people. Williamson states it succinctly, the kingdom is corporate. Mark offers no solo salvation. We're in this together. God calls us into community. To be church is to be a people united as the body of Christ. It is to be a people with two foci, the presence and word of Jesus on the one hand and response to his call to discipleship as his people, his church, the body of Christ on the other. As Christ Church begins to consider transition from the leadership of Father Bill Thomas to that of a new priest in charge, it will be critical to keep these two foci in front. This church is about to move into discernment and succession mode. This is not a personnel issue. It is a God issue. I'm going to say that again. This is not a personnel issue. It is a God issue. Discernment is the work of prayerful listening. Listening to God's voice, God's direction. What has God been up to in your life as a church these past three years? What is God doing among you now? What is God up to in the wider community of Middletown beyond you? And how is God calling you to be engaged in the mission work in that wider community that God is already doing? What does God want you to notice? Life has changed radically for us as the church in the past few decades. We can no longer operate with the same assumptions. The culture is no longer Judeo-Christian if it ever was. The church no longer occupies a privileged place within the culture. The dominant religion of our culture is consumerism, and we are to be a voice in tension with that dominant culture. As Christ Church begins its work of discernment and succession, it will need to be profoundly aware of these changes and seek a clergy leader who is aware of them as well, who will walk with you as we all seek to respond to God's new call. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news Jesus cries out to us today, cries out in love, cries out in urgency. Come, follow me, he bids, invites, beckons. What is your response, Christ Church? What is your response at this turning point moment? This community needs you to live into Christ's call to follow him, to follow him closely. The Diocese of New Jersey needs you to live into Christ's call to follow him. Continue to shine as a gem in Christ's crown and in Christ's glory, a glory that never fades. Come, follow me, Jesus says. Follow me. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever.